Well, good evening again. It's uh, lovely to be back here with you and to uh, together come and worship our Lord, our God. And if Jesus Christ is your Saviour, if you put your faith and trust in Him, then we come and worship and glorify our God in and through our Saviour, Jesus. The psalmist says in Psalm 67, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. That surely should be the prayer of every Christian. I want to uh, read to you a hymn and then we'll come to the Lord in prayer. So this is in Grace Hymns 173. Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love and power that ever mortals knew, that angels ever bore. All are too mean to speak his worth, to mean to set my Saviour forth. Great prophet of my God, my tongue would bless thy name. By thee the joyful news of our salvation came, the joyful news of sin forgiven, of hell subdued, and peace with heaven. Jesus, my great high priest, offered his blood and died. My guilty conscience seeks no sacrifice beside. His powerful blood did once atone, and now it pleads before the throne. My Saviour and my Lord, my Conqueror and my King, Thy scepter and Thy sword, Thy reigning grace I sing. Thine is the power, behold I sit, In willing bonds beneath Thy feet. Should all the hosts of death and powers of hell unknown Put their most dreadful forms of rage and malice on, I shall be safe, for Christ displays superior power and guardian grace. Amen. Lovely Isaac Watts hymn. Well, we're going to come to the Lord in prayer now. And uh, again, I encourage you just to quietly bow your heads and hearts, our minds to Almighty God. Let us meet with our Lord in prayer. Almighty, everlasting God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, again it is our privilege, our joy to be found at the throne of grace this evening. Father, we look to Thee. You are truly almighty, all-knowing. You are omniscient, omnipresent. You know the end from the beginning and everything in between. So, Father, we come to Thee and, Lord, we, as it were, take refuge in Thee. We look for sanctity, for safety. Oh, dear Father, we acknowledge that You are thrice holy and we are sinners, so we, we cannot approach You in our own strength. We cannot approach you as we naturally are, fallen men and women. We can only come in and through the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, that's how we approach thee. In faith. We thank you, Father. That we love you because you first loved us. We thank you, Father, that before the act of creation you had that plan of salvation, a plan that still utterly stuns us, a plan that still causes our conscience to, to flip over and, and, and ask, why us? And Father, we pray as, as we think of our fallenness, of our wretchedness, and Father, when we think of your holiness, oh dear Lord, we we pray, forgive us. Forgive us our sins. 
Father, we pray for others around us. And in many respects, we look around us and see people that are, are better than us, are living respectable lives, law-abiding citizens of the country. But they will not have Jesus. And our hearts are saddened, and our hearts yearn for them to have their eyes open. And so, Father, as they will not pray for themselves, we will pray for them. Or well, we know, Father, that so many uh, citizens, and they would call themselves upright citizens, reject the idea that they are sinners. They keep the law of the land. But, Father, we know your word is clear. All have sinned. All have fallen short of your glory. There is surely no one in this world who would ever dare to claim they have never sinned. And sin is just not um, actions, not even just hurtful words. The thoughts, our thoughts, the thoughts of everyone, we all sin against thee. We've never worshipped you wholeheartedly, fully. Even now as Christians, we have to confess that we fail you every day. And so, Father, we long for men and women, boys and girls, to give up any righteousness or any goodness they might think they have and turn to Jesus. Give up your worldly life and turn to Jesus Christ. No matter how high or how low you feel or how good or how bad you feel. The Lord Jesus Christ will turn no one away. We just come, as the hymn writer put it, as we are. Sin and all. Dirt and all. We come faithfully, trusting, believing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we put our faith in Jesus, oh, we thank you, Father, that you... You look at us and say, our sins have been paid. They have been dealt with. And now you clothe us in Christ's righteousness. So dear Father, we pray. We pray for those that are near to us in our own families. Those that we love and cherish. We pray for them. But we pray for others that maybe we don't get on with quite so well. But Lord, all human beings were made in your image. And so as Christians we pray for all humanity. We pray for those involved in false and man-made religions, caught up in so many mystical things, so many false uh, do-good work things. We pray for them. We pray for others that uh, have been led astray to think there is no God, that we somehow came from a big bang and quite where the Big Bang came from, no one knows, not even the scientists, that somehow nothing created something. And now we have uh, generations who are growing up believing that, that we've just simply evolved and we're at the top of the tree, if you like, of the animal kingdom. Oh dear Father, we're, we know that we're not just intellectual animals. We are spiritual creatures. That's what made in the image of God means. Well, I have a slight problem with the camera. Not sure uh, if my prayer finished with Amen, but uh, I assure you I prayed and uh, finished with a hearty Amen. I'm now going to move on. And uh, unnerved as I am by this camera, uh, that it won't cut out on me again. I want to read to you uh, from Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, <clears throat> chapter 1 from verse 15 through to the end of the chapter. So this is the word of God. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Well, so reads the perfect word of God. And I pray that that will be a blessing to us and that uh, the Lord will help us as we now look into his word. And uh, I want to uh, this evening talk about prayer. Prayer is a most wonderful, amazing gift that we Christians have. A wonderful gift that uh, sadly we don't use enough, but it is a most wonderful gift that God has given us. The old Church of Scotland minister William Barclay used to say this about prayer. When we pray, remember these three things. The love of God that wants the best for us. The wisdom of God that knows what is best for us. The power of God that can accomplish it. Genuine, heartfelt prayers. They cut through all our defences and they draw us ever closer to our Lord. And they also draw us closer to one another. When we pray for each other, we, we, we're drawing closer to each other. And in Ephesians, we are given the blessing of two of the Apostle Paul's prayers. And they are for the people in the church at Ephesus. One is found in our reading, and the other is in chapter 3. These prayers were initially for the church there in Ephesus, but of course, as they are recorded for us in Scripture, they're very much for the church at large, us included. Both prayers are such good examples that have been and have become models for the way that we can and, and should pray for each other. So let's look at the first of those prayers. Following the heartfelt explosion of praise in the first 14 verses, Paul writes in verse 15, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, Paul rejoiced at the evidence that the Ephesians were among those who truly belonged to the Lord. They were among those who truly believed and he and he gives us two reasons for this conclusion first they have faith in the lord jesus christ and we need to note those words very carefully they have faith in the lord jesus christ not simply in god or a god or gods but in the lord jesus christ and I, and i highlight that because today just as in Paul's day, many people in the world believe in God, a God, gods. But they're not followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Far from it. For example, Muslims, Hindus, Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, etc., etc., etc. In fact, James tells us that even the demons believe in in God. I'm sure if we were to ask our friends 
about their belief. They might tell us, oh yes, I believe in God. However, in general terms, the God that they believe is not the God of the Bible, but rather a, a God of their own making, a God of their own imagination. Around the world there is a vast number who have a, a similar God to this. They've got their own mental image of what God should be and what God should do and what God should look like, how God should act. Well, this is nothing more than idolatry, really, hiding in plain sight. But that is not what the Ephesians think. No, no. They have their faith in Jesus Christ. And this is more than simply having knowledge of Jesus or some nice thoughts and feelings about him. Again, there are a huge number of people who like Jesus Christ. There are literally millions who admire him as someone who was a, a good teacher, a good prophet, a terrific example and, and an inspiring figure from history. Millions and millions of people will go that far. If asked on a census questionnaire, many people in this country would automatically tick the box that says Christian. I remember I filled out forms when I used to be at work, way before I was a Christian. And the easiest uh, when it came to religion, the easiest box to tick was C of E. C of E. Christian. But none of this is the same as having a personal faith in Jesus Christ. To have faith in Christ is to embrace the astounding, wonderful truth about him that he is God in the flesh. And then... And then to discard everything else that hinders you from following him. Christ becomes everything. That is what the first disciples did. They discarded everything, literally. They let their, their fishing nets and their boats, they put them to one side and they followed Christ. Faith means believing the truth about Jesus so fully so entirely that it changes the entire direction, the entire thinking of our life on earth. The second reason that Paul believed the Ephesians, that they were sincere followers of Jesus, was because they had a love for all the saints. So important. Now, not everyone who says they have faith in Christ has this love. Not everyone who claims to be a Christian has a love for the saints. Some become aloof. Some become hypercritical. Some become overjudgmental. If we remain in that state, well, I believe that we show we do not have a genuine love for Jesus Christ. We do not have that love working in us. True faith in Christ will transform the way that we see other people. It will impact on the way that we live in the here and now. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote these words. A Christian is a man who has a new test for everyone and everything. When he meets a person for the first time, he does not look at his clothing he does not look at his general external appearance. That is the carnal way of judging people. He does not ask himself, where has he come from? What school has he attended? What is his bank balance? Those are no longer his questions or his tests. He is interested in one thing only now. Is he a child of God? Is he my brother in Christ? Are we related? You see, as Christians, we must see beyond a person's background. 
We must see beyond a person's politics, income level, or appearance. As Christians, we learn to see all people as created in the image of God. Some, some of whom we're going to spend eternity with. I think one good way to describe hell is to, to view it as the height of total self-absorption, pure narcissism. Everyone exclusively wrapped up in themselves. Self, self, and more self. So much so that they slowly perish. And they go on perishing for eternity. Self-centred. Alone. Alone. For their e eternal existence. How terrifying is that? I came across this rather disturbing word picture. After death, a room was observed where there was a large group of starving people who sat around a table full of food. The arms of these people were like long spoons. They could not reach the food without the spoon. However, the elbow joint was missing. Consequently, it was impossible to feed yourself. The only way to survive was to feed and be fed by each other. However, since everyone was more concerned about themselves than the other person, they starved. Paul knew the Ephesians were true believers because he saw the effect of their faith. He saw their unselfish way that they treated one another. If our Christianity does not impact on how we treat other people, it really is a dubious Christianity indeed. So what can be said of us? Do we simply have faith in faith? Or do we have this real, personal, saving faith in Jesus Christ? And I put it that way because today there are a growing number of churches who call themselves Christian churches who proclaim words along this line of just have faith, just believe. But the question is, have faith in what? Believe in what? Faith in our own ability? Faith in, in the great human spirit that will pull us through? A faith that everything will work out? Faith in positive thinking? Faith in evolution and the wisdom of man that they, or man will eventually discover all the answers to every problem. Is that where we could put our faith? The Bible clearly tells us that the only faith and belief that will help us is a belief and a faith in the promise of the Father, the work of the Son, and the strength and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And friends, I must ask, do we, do I, have that kind of faith and belief? And is it evident in my life? Is it evident in your life? So let's move on to what Paul prays. And I want you to know that if your faith is in Jesus Christ, then this prayer of Paul applies to you. And I believe it would be wise for us. Wise for us to pray this prayer from time to time for each other. Praying that we may know our Lord and Saviour better, more personally, more lovingly than maybe we currently do. Because friends, that surely is our greatest need. To know God more fully. Or as the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it, man's chief end is to glorify God, glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Not as something to have all our problems resolved, vanish, 
or to have financial resources enough to live a, a very comfortable, luxurious life? No. Man's chief end is to glorify God. Enjoy Him forever. To, to have a, a true, deep, real knowledge of a, well, of a personal relationship with our Maker. So that we can really enjoy Him forever. Let's start enjoying Him now. We're going to enjoy Him forever in glory. But let's really start that now in this life. Far too many churches are blending in with the world, especially in the West. Churches that want to be part of the status quo more than they want to be a people of conviction. Churches that want to pursue awards rather than character. Churches that want academic degrees more than they want godly education. Churches that want quick returns rather than quality of spiritual growth. Churches more concerned with an outward appearance than an inward spiritual growth. Churches that want to pursue an absence of conflict rather than true reconciliation. Churches that want to pursue a, a religious practice more than to pursue the Lord himself. So churches have become short-sighted. Some have even become blind. And they will eventually fall away from the word of God. And, well, we can see that clearly happening today. Yet closely following God's word, closely following his guidance, his instructions, that is the only true way of the church of Jesus Christ to go. We must remember that God calls Christians to something so amazing, so incredible, that probably none of us fully appreciate its immense and startling value. That the creator of the universe, he calls us, yes, us, sinful human beings, and he calls us into a personal loving relationship with himself. I find that incredible. That God would want such a relation with us. With me. That our Saviour wants us to personally know and, and benefit from his immense pure love. For me. For you. Isn't that stunning? Let me use this analogy. In a good marriage, you are always growing, you are always developing. It is not enough to, to recount the excitement of your wedding day. Talk about the good times you had when you, when you first went out together. A good marriage is one where the relationship is deepening. Partners, they study each other. They get to know each other and they study each other so they see how one another grows with each other. They know what the other is thinking. They begin to learn what every smile, what every raised eyebrow means. They understand their husband or wife's vulnerabilities and their strengths, their likes and dislikes. They know when they are listening and <laughs> they know when they're not. Abiding love and true intimacy develops and builds up over time. And friends, this is the way our relationship with God should be. Isn't it? Should be. God wants us to be fascinated. He wants us to be awestruck with his greatness. To be overcome by his love toward us. Such love. He wants us to spend quality time with him in prayer and reading his word. In short, God wants us to be absorbed by him. Not to be self-absorbed, 
as so many of us are. I read an account recently that not only seriously challenged and convicted me, but left me feeling quite uncomfortable about my current prayer life and my personal closeness to the Lord. The Canadian pastor, Harry Ironside, tells of a meeting he had early in his ministry with an extremely godly man. The man was dying of tuberculosis, and Ironside had gone to visit him. He could barely speak above a whisper. His lungs were almost gone. Yet he said this, Young man, you are trying to preach Christ, are you not? Yes, I am, replied Ironside. Well, he said, sit down a little and let us talk together about the Word of God. This godly man opened his Bible, and until his strength was gone, he opened one, one passage after another, teaching truths that Ironside at that time had never seen or appreciated. Before long, tears were running down Ironside's cheeks, and he asked, where did you get these things? Can you tell me where I can find a book that will open them up to me? Did you get them in a seminary or a college? The man replied, My dear young man, I learned these things on my knees, on the mud floor of a little sod cottage in the north of Ireland, in the north of Ireland. There, with my open Bible before me, I used to kneel for hours at a time and ask the Spirit of God to reveal Christ to my soul and to open the Word to my heart. And He taught me more on my knees, on that mud floor, than I ever could have learned in all the seminaries, seminaries or colleges in the world. This man had come to personally know God. Not just to know of Him, not just to know about him, but to personally know God. So our question should be, how do we do that? How do we get to personally know God? How do we draw closer to him? Well, I haven't got all the answers. Far from it. But I do have six suggestions for us. Firstly, God must become number one priority for us. I know that we can all be busy people. But it is a truth of life that we give our time to most what is most important to us. If you want to know what the highest priority in your life is today, just take a look at your calendar or your diary. When you have to make a choice, what usually wins when you make that choice? That will tell you something. This is why so many people never get to personally know God. Because God, well, He is very low on their list of priorities. If we're going to personally know God, we have to prioritise. We have to make quality time to know Him through His Word and prayer. Maybe we should write on our calendar or our diary at the start of every day. Get to know God. Secondly, we must develop our life of prayer. You may be in a whole room of Noisy children, but if it is your child or your grandchild begins to cry, you immediately hear their voice above all the others. You're, as it were, tuned in to their cry. In a similar way, we have to learn to be alert and tuned in to hear God's voice. We need to be able to pick out His small voice, His whisper even, out of the cacophony of sounds in the world or in our head. We do that the same way as we learn to discern the cry of our child or grandchild by spending time together, by listening, by talking and 
by turning and tuning our ears and our heart to God. Thirdly, of course, we must read our Bibles and we must read the Bible interactively. That means we must read the Bible as if God is personally speaking to us. Some, me included, tend to read Scripture rather academically, trying to master information. And of course, <laughs> there's a lot of information to master. But we must also read intimately the Bible. Read the Bible like you would read a letter from a close friend or a letter from a loved one. And as we read, we must ask and pray that God will good, would give us clarification of what we're reading. We should be careful to check and make sure that we have understood what we have read. And when we have understood, well, we need to take that information into our heart. We need to cherish this. God will speak to us. God will guide us. God will encourage us. God will comfort us through his word. But we have to make time and take time to read his word and to listen to him speaking to us. Fourthly, we need to be willing to step out in faith. We will never know what it means to follow Christ unless we actually go out of our way to follow him. No matter what the world throws at us. And make no mistake about that. It does take courage to do this. It takes courage to go against the tide. To go in a different direction. It takes courage and resolve to go against the tide of, of current thinking. And current behaviour. If we want to closely know God, we should be willing to take risk in obedience to Him. A few sermons ago, I, I, I talked about Peter stepping out of the boat. We need sometimes to step out of that boat, step out of that comfort zone in faith. It might be that God will, over the next week or so, personally call you or me to talk to a friend about their spiritual life. Or abide by the morality of scripture, even though it may mean being called a, a, a prude or old-fashioned. Or being labelled judgmental by some. Maybe we're called to, to go where God wants us to go and take ministry there. Or to give lavishly to someone in need, someone we might not get on with, to help out, not just financially, but with time and effort. Maybe God will call us to forgive someone who has hurt us deeply. To pray with someone in need, even though you're afraid you will appear ridiculous or, or you'll muddle all your words. What will God personally call us to? We don't know. But we should be ready to go, to do his will. And as we dare to trust God, we will grow in our faith. We will grow in our personal relationship with him. I don't pretend this is easy. Not at all. But I know this. God will help us. He will guide us on our way. Fifthly, we must learn from others. We will learn from others about God's greatness. We'll learn about God's generosity when we meet those who have been with God a lot longer than us. I, I have been blessed by meeting elderly Christians. I can think of two or three men especially that have been such a help. And they're in glory now. 
But just to have an hour or two with them was such a rich, rich blessing. Now, we might do this through a, a small formal group, maybe. Generally we do this sort of thing over a cup of tea. We go and visit someone. We might just talk together about great things God has done. And, and before you know it, you're, you're spiritually uplifted. Sixthly, we must study a bit. Now, although we don't want just a dry academic relationship with God, there are, of course, blessings to be found in learning and studying more about him. Of course there are. We need to read some good commentaries. Read about the attributes of God. About spiritual disciplines such as prayer, Bible study, seeking holiness. Good subject. We need to grow in our understanding of these things. And as we grow, then our desire will be fueled to know and love God more and more. Paul clearly understood that our number one pursuit on earth should be to know God and love him more deeply and more fully, to draw closer to him. But Paul didn't stop there. He even asked for more, that we may know the inheritance he has for us as believers. Paul asked in verses 18 to 19, the, and he says these words, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Paul is praying that we might come to understand the rich the very rich blessings and amazing privileges that are given to us in Christ Jesus. We mustn't forget these. Think about what God has given us through Jesus Christ. Forgiveness. All our sin, past, present and future, all of it. Totally erased. He's given us a position. We are a child of God. We're granted all the privileges that come with that incredible position. Access. We can approach and seek God at any time. No barrier. That's been removed. Freedom. We are free from the enslaving power of sin. We don't have to go down that path anymore. Purpose. God has given each of us a meaningful role to play in the advancement of his kingdom. And no matter how small that role appears, it gives us purpose. It's a blessed position. It's a wonderful thing to be in that role, working for the Lord. Hope, the fear of death, is replaced by a certain hope of eternal glory. Strength. Well, we are given a supernatural strength. We're given it for hard times, difficult times. And we're given it so that we can clearly know that God is with us. We can understand that we, we have this power, this strength. We have this confidence, this godly confidence, where once we might have been filled with fear. And I have to tell you, this is just scratching the surface. Paul prays that we might begin to understand your understanding being enlightened, he says, so that we will follow our Lord, we will follow our Saviour more passionately, more persistently, more personally, more lovingly. Paul wants us to know something of God's unsurpassed power. In the Greek, Paul piles up words that mean power, such as the word for dynamite and energy. He points out that the same awesome power that created the universe, 
The same power that raised Jesus from the grave. This is the power that we have been given. Been given this power through Jesus Christ, I'll say. And this should remind us that we're not powerless in this world. We feel it at times, but we're not. We're not hapless pawns in the chess game of life. Far from it. The power that works in us is the same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead, took Jesus to heaven after his resurrection. This is the power that works in us. It raised Jesus above all, all demonic foes, all enemies, and that same power, that same power is at work in you and I, Christian. With this mighty power available to us, there should never be, and never need be, a power shortage in the Christian life. Someone put it like this, if the death of Christ is the supreme demonstration of the love of God, the resurrection of Christ is the supreme demonstration of his power. Verses 21 to 10, 23 tell us where this great power has placed Jesus. Far above. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Just think of the paradox here. Paul is speaking of a personage of history, of recent, almost contemporary history. Jesus had worked with his hands. He had walked from place to place, just like other men. People could no doubt accurately describe his look and his manner when he talked. And yet now, this same man, Jesus, is seated at the right hand of Almighty God, on his very throne. Truly, he is the Son of Man and the Son of God. This resurrection power placed Christ Jesus above everything. Everything. Put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. An evangelical theologian summed it up nicely and he said this, Yes, this is here given as the final glory of the infinitely exalted Christ. Angels and archangels are subject to him, but believing men are joined to him with a union such that he and they by this same messenger of his are called elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, one Christ. Let me conclude. This is a glorious prayer. And I feel that if I was a school teacher, I would want to leave you with the assignment to memorise and pray this prayer. But I'm no school teacher, and I'm hopeless at memorising anything much these days. So I won't ask you to memorise it. But I will suggest that we all, from time to time, read this prayer and pray this prayer. Pray it for your own life. Pray it for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray it for your family and friends. Pray it for the leaders of this country. Pray it for this country. Pray it to ask God to help increase your desire to know him and love him more deeply. Maybe we can pray this prayer of Paul's until it becomes our prayer. Until it becomes our heart and our obsession, our passion. For when we start truly hungering for these things, our lives, our outlook, our attitudes, they will be transformed. We will make Holy Spirit inspired choices. We will discover a deeper and more profound spiritual life. In addition, others will see the way we live 
Others will notice the way that we begin to talk. And may even be touched when we let them know that we, we pray for them because we love them so. Today there are huge swathes of the population who are trying to make any sense of this world in which we live. And some of those people we know. Some of those people are in our own families. Life can be difficult difficult enough but living a life without purpose or meaning living a life of confusion or living a life simply for the next thrill that comes along will not satisfy anyone in the end as spiritual beings mankind needs more we all need more Mankind needs a personal spiritual relationship with his or her creator. Let us pray that those around us will see that as Christians we don't just have an academic knowledge of God, but we actually know him. We love him. We personally know our Saviour. And what we Christians have, what we Christians have in our hearts, I assure you, dear listener, whoever you are, you can have, all can have, by faith and trust in him, Jesus Christ. Remember, there is no power in this world that can stand against the power of the living God. And I finish with these words from Scripture. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to close, if we've got enough memory left in the camera, with this hymn. They are words... But uh, from a 13th century manuscript that was found in Germany, they were translated from Latin to English by a man by the name of James Woodford. Christ above all glory seated, King triumphant, strong to save, dying, thou hast death defeated, buried, thou hast spoilt the grave. Thou art gone where now is given, where no mortal might could gain. On the eternal throne of heaven, in thy Father's power to reign. There thy kingdoms all adore thee, heaven above and earth below, while the depths of hell before thee, trembling and defeated bow. We, O Lord, with hearts adoring, Follow thee above the sky. Hear our prayers, thy grace imploring. Lift our souls to thee on high. So when thou again in glory on the clouds of heaven shalt shine, we thy flock may stand before thee, own forevermore as thine. Hail, all hail in thee confiding, Jesus, thee shall all adore. In thy Father's might abiding, with one Spirit evermore. Amen.